Hi, I'm here with Suzanne Ciani, an electronic music pioneer, composer, sound designer responsible for iconic sounds in commercials and video games, and not only a pioneer, but someone who's still leading the pack today with amazing modular performances. And Suzanne, first, I wanted to thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you. It's uh, very early here this morning, so uh, <laughs> I hope I'm as alert as you are. We're in different time zones. Yes, yes. So I'll give a bit of background. Uh, why I asked you to come on this call. Um, I first had the opportunity to hear you play at Sonar uh, last week in, last year in Barcelona. And I went to the show expecting a good synth gig. I actually didn't know that, uh, that you played quadraphonically and was caught completely off guard by the fact that sounds weren't coming from the stage, but rather swirling all over the place. Um, now, at the time, I sort of um, saw it as magic, frankly, because the music was magic and the, the performance was magic. But then recently, I saw you perform at Moogfest and heard about your quadraphonic album, uh, sort of bringing quad to the masses. And I told myself that I just had to demystify this and put together a clip with a few ideas and a workflow so that as many people as possible could, could create and experience quadraphonic sound. So that's when I reached out to you and you agreed uh, to come on board, so thanks so much. So, I, so first, a few uh, sort of a, a few questions just about context before we get to the nitty gritty details. Um, your tool of choice for creating quadraphonic music is obviously the Bukla, and and there's the two two seven in there. But can you talk a bit about the history of of how you know how did quadraphonic come into Bukla's uh, instruments? By the time I met Bukla in the late 60s, and it's when I went to work for him at his, uh, you know, his uh, studio, uh, you know, soldering and putting, assembling circuit boards, uh, everything was always quad. By then it was quad. Everything we did was quadraphonic. It was just a, a given. Uh, probably Bukla, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever researched it or given him credit for being the first one to make a spatial interface, but probably he was. And uh, so I grew up on, on quad. And, uh, you know, in my new uh, career now, going back to the boot club, I am, of course, I need to play in quad, and it's always been non-negotiable. And it led to, uh, you know, in the early days, I stopped performing because people weren't ready for quad. You couldn't go to a major theater and get quadraphonic, and therefore I couldn't play. So I spent some years trying to advance the concepts of performance spaces so that they would include uh, the possibility of spatial sound and also the possibility of, you know, other electronic uh things like yep. visuals yeah yeah so like, like for example in sonar it was a huge venue um and how how did you get them to to get it to work in quad because i assume all the others didn't ask for that it wasn't easy you know because the bigger the space and and they don't understand completely they don't understand when you're coming in and saying no i have to have this you have to be very firm if there's any opening at all they will wiggle through it. So for me, it's non-negotiable. I do quad, period. And that was a struggle because they had these huge, you know, towers of speakers in the front. And I told them that they had to be matched. That quad, Some people don't understand that either. They Because there was a time when quad represented, say, an acoustic theater where the main sound was in the front and then there was some, you know, residual sound in the back. And that was the purpose of quad to, you know, portray a traditional theatrical space. So that wasn't the case. And uh, so I just I just fought until yeah. they, which, they matched. Which, which leads me to, to sort of a, a thought that I or a question that I had. It's it's it is different than 5.1 surround sort of. Do you do you sort of think of where the audience is facing? Because it seems like it's coming from all over the place. You know, when you watch a 5.1 movie, there's everything's up front, and sometimes there's occasionally something in the background. With your music, it just it wraps around you all the time. That's why um, live electronic music is the perfect content for spatial sound, 
because in a in you know five one is basically a theatrical format, yep. and the one you know, the 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 five is the the dialogue in the middle and the front. It's essentially quad with one more speaker in the front for the for the voice to speak, and they are portraying really a a traditional space and mapping the they're mapping the location mostly after the fact. Yep. So with electronic music, the space is generated live as part of the performance, and it is, uh, it's a parameter, just the same as, you know, a filter or a pitch or uh, an amplitude. But do you think of it as front and back, or is it just always, always swirling and, and sort of, it doesn't matter. It seemed to me that as I was listening to your album, it didn't matter where I was facing, it's just it was the 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 feeling of of everything of motion and movement was more important than whether I was facing in a particular direction. Yes, um, it's not as critical as one would think. Yep. To you know the experience you can experience from just about any place in the space, but also uh, part of that is because honestly the sound is only in you know one position at a time. Mm -hmm. So this problem of masking which is an audio problem. If you're sitting next to a speaker that has sound and there's sound coming from another speaker across the room, you might not hear that speaker across the room. But in this type of spatial movement, because it's generated with control voltages and it's really only in one place at a time, mm -hmm. yep. you get the experience no matter where you are. Now you mentioned that, that uh, rightfully so, that it's sort of a parameter, just like a filter and pitch and so on. If you had to, to, I know it's it's hard, a general question, but if you had to say what percent of your brain CPU you allocate to spatial movements versus pitch, timbre, and so on, what, how, because it seems like it's always changing. Uh, I have uh, three or four, maybe five uh, spatial uh, algorithms that I use. So mm -hmm. some of them are continuous. In the continuous department, you know, that means it's moving uh, from one speaker to another in a linear way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's connected. Another one is discrete. So that means it's jumping. And when it jumps from one speaker to another, it has to be in time with the music. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that's no problem because the bukla is generating the position as well as the rhythm of the music. Uh, I use random discrete so that it is jumping. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there's another position which is a swirl. This is a button on the 227E that is kind of like, you know, that cheap effect, but it's fun, yeah. right? The swirl. Um, I can voltage control the swirl. So the, it's the speed, not just the rate. steady state. Yeah, the rate is changing, and in fact, it is changing because you're right. I don't have that many hands, yep. so I have, um, you know, I try to keep things simple in performance. Uh, the other thing that I've added recently was that the question because I don't want to well, go on. Well, I guess the on. question the question was, um, what 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 percentage of your your sort of time or attention or brain power is. Um, is allocated towards that versus other things that, because obviously there's a lot of other things going on. Right. Well, each musical uh, section, let's say, you know, the composition is organized. In, you know, I start with ocean waves, and those go very slowly in a continuous pattern around the mm -hmm. room. So it's continuous, but it also has a little bit of variation in it. Uh, when I go into rhythm, I change the spatial pattern so that it is now uh, moving rhythmically because that makes sense. If I've yeah. got a rhythm going, I have the option of having a spatial rhythm as well, and that's what I do. Uh, I do other things that are more environmental. So you're immersed in, uh, say, a very reverberant space where it's not so pinpointed. And in that case, I might split up my outputs. I might have uh, a white noise going into a swirl pattern. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have four outputs. I have four, not not just outputs. I have four spatial modulators yep. in the system. Yeah, let's look, let's look at the module a little bit. 
the, see, in order for the control voltage to be functioning, you have to go all the way into this position. But now, if you're out of that position, then these knobs become like the X and Y. So this is the rear, mm -hmm. this is, and this is left rear, right rear. This is the front, this is right and left front. Then if you do a swirl, these become the rate and the amplitude. So this is a, a, a you know, a more uh, extreme placement. This is a closer placement. This is the direction and the rate. So it's faster going to the right, slower, faster. Nice. So, and this this one is how far out, you know, this is the amplitude of that. Here it has no amplitude, it's not really moving, right? It's just stuck there. It's, it's, yeah, it's just in the center. Disturbed. It's in the center. And as I turn up this amplitude, you're going to see a more defined movement. Yes. Okay. So that's it. But, you know, uh, for a sound check, mm -hmm. it's wonderful to have this mode because can, you know, specify, you know, left front, right front, whatever, you know, right rear. I can place it in a particular speaker. But for performance, that mode uh doesn't doesn't intrigue me very yeah. much. Yeah, it's harder. It's harder to uh, to work to move something when you have to go X Y. It's easier if you can just rotate it um, and put it closer or far. So I have, as you can see, I have bridged the inputs here, uh, and so I'm getting the rate and the amplitude with the control voltage here. That is, in this case, a slow envelope. So this is going to move the sound. I use this for the ocean sound. Mm -hmm. And this is going to move the sound slowly around the room. Uh, and that's very effective in the ambient, immersive sense of being in that environment. You really feel that. Um, so this is like one pattern that I use. It's a control voltage that is a slow envelope that's bridged into both inputs. And so it causes uh, almost circular motion slowly around the room. When I get into a rhythmic uh, pattern, and I'm going to show you that, mm -hmm. what's going to happen, I let me see if I can show you this H9. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay, so this is my processing, and as you can see, I have a control voltage that's affecting the mix, and that's a way of shifting the perspective, the distance, of the sound because this is a reverb mm -hmm. but when I get to a rhythmic section I move this input the control voltage that's affecting it and I take a rhythmic control voltage and now it's going to start to jump rhythmically so if you want to hear the sound nice So what that does, it makes the sound bigger, it makes the space bigger and smaller. And it's, the, the movement is random, but it's in sync with the rhythm, which is extremely important. Because if any motion is not synchronized with the actual rhythm, it's going to add its own rhythm, because spatial movement is rhythm. And uh, so, you know, I'm lucky in the Buchla that I can, uh, you know, get a random control voltage that is synchronized with the rhythm through the use of a sample on hold. Of course. Of you course. know, anybody can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's, that's really a fun uh, spatial. When I get to, uh, let's say, another use of this, I have to modify this a little, little bit. Um, I go into a more gentle sound and as the okay so 
For this particular type of sound, it's not appropriate to be jumping around. It's a high end. I go back to the swirling approach, at the, uh, the control voltage input, and I add a swirl. And now the control voltage is affecting the rate and the amplitude of the swirl. So, and it's changing the direction of it. But it gives so it, it's a very alive sound so what we're looking at is these not these yep. these are down can you hear that a little bit yes yes i can now do you um while we're, we're talking about the others do you sometimes do maybe two different motions um because you, obviously you've got four of these at your disposal. Do they move, always move in sync or not move at all? Or do you occasionally have no. a few motions going? Okay, so this is more of like a jungle sound. This is like a jungle patch. Mm -hmm. And what I do is on, on this one, I have this white noise that's swirling actively. And then the other on the other side, I have this thing moving more erratically. So Yeah. So it's more of an ambient thing. This one is kind of nice. Just yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, cool. You get it. Um and I don't know if it's um if it's easy for you to recreate the and if not it, it's cool. But are you able to recreate the, um, you know, the, the white noise running around the room? That a really uh, nice part of of, uh, of the show. Uh, oh sure, let's see. Um, let me just get that patched in. So what's happening there is that um, I've got uh, you know the this the uh, random voltage and the swirl on. Mm -hmm. So that it's really kind of a frenetic yep. spatial sound, but it's definitely in sync with the rhythm. Otherwise, it would be a mess. Yep. Uh, the other thing is this other section over here. See how this is just continuously panning slowly? Yep. I In a big venue, I use this as a fill because this experience is very... Um, it, it's uh, ex more extreme in a large space, you know, where it's jumping from one distance to another. And, and uh, sometimes I need just a little room fill. So I'll put this up just so that there's kind of a, a fill in the room that's going on. If you were to hear this one alone, it's just a little soft reverberant thing that's more consistent in the room yep. and then I add this over it which is cool uh, in the old days we had something very primitive but functional which was called a voltage controlled spring reverb One of the uh, factors of perception of illusionary spaces is what we thought we were creating them was illusionary spaces, is how close or how far away something is. So if you have a sound that is close, say it has no, no reverb, right? Mm -hmm. And if you increase the reverb, it, it makes you think that the sound is further away. So with a voltage-controlled reverb, as simple as it was, you could make things come close and go far away as well as move. Cool. So you, yeah, it's very cool. And there's really nothing that does that. But uh, I had, I have some, my, my effects are done on H9s, even tied yep. H9s. Yep. And I had those modified. 
So it, this is not ideal, but it's better than nothing. I can control the mix. So the reverb, in essence, yep. becomes less or but, more, and I have a voltage control input now. So that doesn't come with the original H9, but if you modify it at Northern Lights in Denmark, you can get a control voltage input and enhance your spatial dimensions cool. with that. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, yes, I noticed that your, your, in a recent clip, your H9s are sort of embedded in a Buchla case. Yes. <laughs> That's custom, I assume. That's, it's not a new product yeah. coming out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's customized in, this is my custom rack here. Nice. Uh, and I'm going to show you the interface because there's an interface for this H9. Uh, let's see, I just have to Bluetooth it. So, yeah, uh, I noticed that you were sort of moving it uh, in, so using the gyro of the iPad to change the effect. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. I love this interface, the H and I. It's you know, it's so wonderful. The only sad thing really is that they think of this as a guitar pedal. They don't think of it as something that can be used by electronic, you know, performers. So it's high impedance input. It distorts. I don't know if you noticed it sonar, but you know, Actually I, 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 to, Yeah, I, I reviewed it. I reviewed the um the H9 and it works. It works really nicely on on synths. Plus, I also showed a little uh, not a hack, but it, you can actually use the expression pedal input to put control voltage into it. And um, so, I'll, I'll in sort of in the follow up clip, I'll show people how to do uh, what that company did in terms of modification. Just anyone can do it at home uh, with a little little plug. Let's yep. See, can you see it? So yes. this is the. This is the graphic. It's it's called tilt. Yep. And so the you can decide what parameters you know it's going to affect when you when you tilt it. And I use it, you know, basically on the ocean to create, you know, more impact on the waves. Where do you put um, it in the signal chain? Is it is it I assume it's before the space? Um, yes, or? that's interesting because when I first wanted to incorporate these I thought I needed, of course, two H9s because I had four channels. And uh, even tied some in two H9s. And I thought, uh oh, uh, how do I synchronize these? Because I need the, I need them to be interlocked. And then I realized, oh, if I just do this, the uh, processing before the space, I'll be fine. So now I have two separate systems. I have one H9 on two of the 227 outputs and one H9 on the other two. Hmm. And that's another uh, advantage, actually, because, and this is another aspect of this whole issue, is that in a very large space, if you're too discreet, if you have the sound in one speaker only, it leaves the rest of the space a bit um, too naked. Hmm. So what I do is that I have kind of a fill. So there's always a little sound. I use the second set of 227s uh, to just provide some level of, of slow moving ambient you know, sound there. So you still experience the jumping and the moving and the, you know, the primary spatial movement, but you have a bed underneath that will kind of soften nice. the nakedness. Yeah. Nice. I find that I f use fewer and fewer presets uh, when I'm working just because keeping it simple is important. Uh, so I have right now, I use, uh, you know, a, a certain long delay on the waves. Then I have a flanger mm -hmm. that's pretty dramatic that brings in the next movement to rhythm so I can follow that flange curve. Then I go to kind of a nice, consistent uh, reverb where I can control the tempo. So 
when I'm using that, I will tap the tempo in so that it's it's important that the delays and reverbs be uh, synchronized yep. Yep. with the rhythm. So I love this because it's very easy. What this hot switch does is it will jump with the voltage. And if I assign that hot switch to the mix, and you can set the range, you go here, say all the way down, and here, all the way up, then when you're moving this, can you see that? Yep, yep. Okay, then when you're moving that, you're getting no reverb and max. Nice, yeah, the dry wind, cool. Yeah. Cool. Nice, nice. You know, there's, I wanted to ask you something about, I don't know if, if you noticed it, like in stereo panning, um, sometimes too much panning can be nauseating, whereas it doesn't yeah. happen that much in my experiments with quad. Do you, do you notice that or is it just, does it happen in quad too? Is it uh, a distance from speakers? You know, uh, notice that Sometimes, you know, if I'm speeding up a sequence and the, the motion, if I have it set up to be moved on every beat, that it starts to actually produce uh, uh, an audio signal almost, you know. The movement is so rapid that it starts to uh, make artifacts that are, you know, acoustic, you know, that are, are sonic. It, in the quad album, that was my first performance in 40 years. My wow. first solo boot clip performance in 40 years. So, uh, you know, I did notice that some of the spatial movement was a bit extreme. You know, it was so fast. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it can make it nauseated. And that's why I don't use swirl very much, because I think swirl is particularly nauseating. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah. No, it's it's it sounds good. <laughs> so let me play um, a few things. So a few seconds for you of uh, a few spots, and let's see if this works well. So let's see if the if the demo gods are working. <laughs> So that was, I think, a, sort of a basic swirl, but if you had any comment on what was going on there. Um, what's going on there, I think, is is discreet. I mean, I'm not sitting in your quad space, but yep. typically, and I said that was my first concert, so, you know, maybe I hadn't crystallized yet a lot of my, you know, approaches to this. Uh, and I was dealing with a new instrument, you know, because the 200E is not the 200. Uh, so a lot of things have changed since that. Uh, when I listened to this, I realized that I was using a different, you know, I was using the 291 uh, E filter, mm -hmm. and I got rid of that. I had a clone built at the 291 200. Uh, it's less nasal. I mean, that has its, its own personality, that filter. And it has no... Um, the control voltage input goes in only one direction. It just gets brighter, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, that's why it's so bright. Um, but typically in that space now, I would be using the, uh, the sequencer pulse on every stage, going into a sample and hold, putting out uh, a, a random control voltage that then would be affecting the, uh, the XY axis of the, of the sound. So when you're sitting there, because I'm not sitting there of right course. now, it, it's not swirling, is it? It, it is, is it is, yeah, that, that one was, did feel like it was your plan. Yeah. There's one bass, there's sort of a slow bass line, and then a fast, a fast swirl. Or random, maybe it's random. And now it's slowing well, down, and now it's,
okay, you know, I'm trying to remember when I did that concert, um, I had a different setup. I think I had two uh, 227s. Hmm. The, the, uh, because I was using two groups of modules. I had, you know, my basic, I had to downsize to just survive on the road. So now I just have a very compact 18 pound unit. But as I recall in that concert, I had, uh, I had two setups that were then, uh, locked rhythmically yeah so you know what you what you hear is what I'm is is what's happening um, it can't get complex because if I had the swirl on and I also had a random voltage going in it would swirl but it would also have cool. another move too yeah and I think that's what you're getting there yep let me play you another another okay. part this is around 10 minutes in so this is like horses or footsteps. <laughs> white noise um, yeah I mean I, I I like to go into a section usually that has no pitch and that's just an improvisation on you know it's more percussive the white noise it's just kind of pure percussive um, yeah so it sounds like you know I, I instead of right now I'm using a Marth a 248 it's a clone of the 200 mm -hmm. for that concert I didn't have the Marth I had um, a 250, which is a DARF. Do you know that module? Yes, yep. With a circle, oh. the circular. Yes, yep. the oval. Uh, so I was using, I actually had two DARFs because mm -hmm. I had those two side-by-side -side systems. And, uh, but they were locked. So it sounds as if one of them is doing a slower, you know, rate, but locked to the one that's doing the faster rate. Let me play, uh, there's a couple more. Let me play this for you. Um. Sounds like a reverse effect. thoughts about that yeah with the 250 you have one row that just uh controls the the uh, position the time on any particular position uh there what i'm doing is i'm stopping uh something and that reverse sound i think is in the effect i think that's in the h9 uh and i might have stopped that sound either using the keyboard because i had that set up to stop and start, uh, or I might have done it with just a position on a stage to say, stay there longer on that stage. Um, cool. Let me try one more. Last one. Yeah. Any thoughts or any? Uh... <laughs> it just, it's just it doesn't, there's don't have to be thoughts. Just cool stuff that I, just, I wanted to play because it sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Not you don't necessarily need to comment I, on. I it. guess it, it it's really fun. You know what I hear when I'm hearing that, or when I hear any live performances, I'm hearing myself thinking. You know because the process of performing this instrument live is that you're you know you're on right. 
if you don't interact with it, it just kind of dies, right? So you have to, you know, your 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 process is to continually interact with the machine in in you know in a feedback system. Like, oh, I hear that now. I want to move this now. I want to move that, and that's why it's so much fun to do, because you're in the moment, yep. doing it. And when I hear any passage, I can say, oh, okay, I'm looking. I'm looking. Oh, I found it. Okay, next. You know, so uh, cool. Yeah, I mean, you don't you don't want it to get stuck yeah. ever. Cool, cool. Yeah. So if people want to listen to this album in quad, um, I know they can buy the vinyl and there's a, do you have that? Can you show us the, the, the decoder, the thing that it comes with it? Do you have it? You know, I, I was just in LA a couple of days ago and um, I turned in my decoder oh, okay. because there's a new, a newer, there's a newer version. Um, the packaging is beautiful. I didn't bring it back because it didn't fit in my suitcase. Uh, but, uh, it's it's just a board about you know four by six, and it's got four RCA outputs on one edge, and it has a stereo input on the other edge. So it's been encoded. You can listen to it in stereo. Yep. And you can take that stereo output, put it into the decoder, and out will come the four decoded. Uh, you know, spatial positions. And you can put those directly, if you want, into your powered speakers. You know, that's the easiest thing to do. I don't know. What do you do? How do you so, do that? So, well, I, um, I mean, you were kind enough to send me the the separate um, tracks. So, because I, I couldn't get it decoded. I, um, I tried, I spoke with Kamran and he said that, uh, you know, a stereo receiver should be able to decode it, but it didn't work for me, at least not spot the way that it streams on Spotify. Um, so yeah, I, I I got the individual tracks from you. I'm just wondering how people because the album is a little bit expensive. If people want to stream it on Spotify, and and I've been emailing back and forth with Kamran. I'll try and find a software solution for it, but those are pretty expensive to de decode. Uh, mm -hmm. Dolby, I think it's Pro Logic Two or something. But uh, he mentioned he's working on a plugin that would be free. That uh, but that would be maybe ready sometime next year. Yes, yes, because. Honestly, you know, speakers can have this software built in, uh, and and then it wouldn't be any any problem. I think, you know, the first time around when these um, decoding systems were being you know experimented with, um, there wasn't any agreement on you know what would happen, and the whole thing I think it died because of lack of content. Yeah, I mean, th there were a lot of albums made in quad but yeah i heard pink they floyd uh pink floyd yeah. uh, the dark side of the moon um and there are yes. a few other mastered nice uh nice albums but it doesn't compare it's sort of uh it's a different experience i think that that like you mentioned the m music that's taken and then processed to be in quad is sort of yeah there's the the band is performing there and you're here and there's some effects uh in the background it's not designed to be the way you do it, basically. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now that so many kids are playing analog uh, modular instruments, I think the only thing that's missing is the modules, you know, that can control that space. I mean, the 227 is a dream, uh, but what else do you have? There are a few things, but they're not there yet. So. And then we have, yeah, we need the, the reverb too. We need this close and far away. So I'm, I'm in part two. I'm going to show all those things. I've got, uh, I've got. You oh. know, if people have a VCA, I'll show them how to hook up six VCAs to make a quad system, and uh, <laughs> and I'll show them the reverb. That's possible too, and uh, and there are a few other modules that I'll be checking out that have that have quad capabilities. So I'll sh I'll sh show that in part two. Um, all you right. Can I, so, it, you can always gate the reverb, right? I mean, you can you know, have it come and go. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, yeah, I mean, the thing about performing is that you need a very portable system and, you know, you can't have all those. Yeah. I, I mean... Where can people follow you, you know, see where you perform? Uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or... 
Um, I also, I know I have, I have a website. I'm not, you know, my assistant kind of puts everything, all the concerts are up on my website. Cool. And, uh, yeah. All right. But Twitter, Facebook, it's Great. all there. So Sarah. thank yeah. you so okay. much for coming on board. <laughs> and, uh, okay. yeah, I hope to see you perform soon you. sometime. Okay. Great. Thank you. you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.